Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I formally welcome you uh, to this uh, series of webinars on uh, Splintronics. Um, somehow, <laughs> the number of participants are uh, decreasing. Uh, that's a little bit of concern, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are really grateful to uh, many uh, eminent speakers uh, for kindly agreeing and giving their lectures here and making a good platform for our uh, Spintronics community, in particular for the beginners of the field. And today I'm really pleased uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Rohit Medwal, whom I know from a uh, very long time uh, when uh, he was uh, like an assistant professor at uh, Delhi. So a uh, very uh, brief introduction about his uh, career. He finished his PhD in 2013 um, from University of Delhi. Um, and he got the uh, Anil Kevhati uh, Patnagar uh, Award for the best doctoral thesis in solid state physics from Indian Physics Association in 2013. Uh, then he was working uh, as an assistant professor in Hansraj College uh, for about two years. Um, or one and a half years uh, until early 2015. And then he moved uh, for some time uh, to University of Puerto Rico as a postdoctoral fellow. And then he moved on, in August 2015 to uh, Kyushu Institute of Technology, uh, Professor Fukuma, as a postdoc and worked there for a year. And, th and since uh, November 2016, he is working as a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Nanyang Technological University. So uh, one of my aim is also to promote uh, the young steps uh, in this uh, webinar platform. And Rohit is doing a very nice work, uh, extremely uh, uh, prominent uh, publications he has got in the last couple of years. I'm very proud and happy to see that. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to a lecture, uh, Rohit. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vedanta, for the nice introduction. And then it's my pleasure that I'm giving a talk here. And uh, initially, afterward, I was discussing with Professor Vedanta about the Spintronics and the future collaborations. And we realized that, oh, we can have come together. And this is the platform where I can deliver my talk. And it's really a ple big pleasure for me to uh, deliver a talk on the WTS webinar series on the Spintronics. And without the further ado, I would like to start my talk where the title of the talk is Controlling and Probing of the Spins. I'm uh, actually working in Nanyang Institute of uh, Nanyang Technical University, in Singapore, and I'm a visiting researcher in the QC Institute of Technology, Japan. So we have active collaboration on the spin transport measurement. And in NTU, after coming in NTU, we started the Terahertz Spintronics, which is a, like basically a combination of the spin transport gigahertz and of course the ultra fast magnetism. So basically what happens if we see digital world. In the digital world, if you see that the, the amount of the data which we are storing today, and if we see the 2025, what will happen? We can have the 35 zeta bit data, which is two to the power 70 bytes. It's an enormous amount of data. Nobody can think about how to store this data, how to basically handle this data, how to transfer from one place to another place. Even in the pandemic situation, you can see the digital world we are now the talk is given by the Zoom platform. We are using the Zoom, we are using Skype, everybody using all the different online sources to present their work, to store their data information. And it's, it's, it's a big challenge for the society. It's a big challenge. How to store this data, how to transfer this data. We need the really uh, new techniques. Like if you imagine that this is, this is the data which has been stored in the DVD. If you imagine this data has been stored in the DVD, what could have been? You could have the DVDs in a, such a huge amount. You can, if you stack the DVDs one over the other, you can have a drive to move over the DVD. Such a large number of DVDs you could have stored till now. But thanks to technology, we have hard disks now. The Seagate has already come to the hammer heat assisted recording media, and where people are trying to store the pack the high density data storage, and the using that data. We have to transfer the data to one place to another place. We have to have the high speed of transfer. So the data processing as well as data transfer rate and data speed, all these are matters in this society. So keeping that in mind, the people are trying to work in two different directions, the electronic and photonic approach. 
electronic approach we do have the gigahertz frequencies and in photonics we can really go for the further terahertz and even the beyond the terahertz frequencies so in that direction the spintronics emitters has come very far from this field and really i uh, place a prominent place and what we can see how the spintronics emitters are consists of i'll just go to the basic so that we can understand what is the spintronics emitters are basically spintronics emitters are consists of the ferromagnet this is shown by the yellow color and then followed by the this is the heavy metal and when you excite the spintronics emitters using the laser from the second laser light there is a from the second excitation so what happen this spins try to super diffuse and the magnetization of materials try to reduce so there is a demagnetization process as well as a super diffusion process so this super diffusive spins and demagnetization try to go to the adjacent heavy metal and convert this spin current to a charge current and as we know these are the transient spin current which is going to the transient charge current and this transient charge current because of the spin hall effect given by the spin hall effect will result in that emission of terahertz radiations from the heavy metal so keeping that in mind let's go to the further basics of this ultrafast magnetization what happen if you shine a light on the ferromagnets the magnetization quenches and this effect was first observed in the 1996 in the prl paper they have observed that within the few hundred from the hundreds of femtoseconds you can quench the magnetization of a ferromagnetic materials in the almost 2 to 300 from the second time scales this is a very fast phenomena ultra fast phenomena really and the utilizing this we can have actually a very high speed density packing storage as well as the transfer information devices so so there was a quite debate quite a big debate between what is the possible reason what are the mechanism different mechanism behind this phenomena and what could be the reasons so there was a debate that oh this can be a spin flip scattering mechanism where the electron electron interactions electron phone interactions and electron magnetic interactions when there is a light metal interactions all these things the interactions are happening and as a result of this there will be a spin flip scattering mechanism can dominate over the others but on the other hand there is another mechanism was also discussed and discussed where the spin transport mechanism was taking care where they say that when we excite the ferromagnet there is a ballistic transport of the majority and minority spins which results Uh, from the excited regions and can transfer to the interface or adjacent heavy metal or non metal systems so these two phenomena was really in the competition and was a full uh, is what in the full debate and after that the uh, batiato marco batiato he is actually our collaborator also he he proposed this theory in 2010 in the prl and he said that oh the super diffusive phenomena is very important where when you shine a light on the heavy metal what happen there is excitation of spins when because of the, this heating effect you shine a light on the heavy metals ferromagnet there is excitation of the spins and there's a majority spins and the minority spins so majority and minority spins are excited and there is a collision or the scattering between the minority spins because of the higher scattering in the minority spins they don't diffuse uh, in the heavy metal and the, the probability of the diffusing heavy metal is much lower as compared to the probability of diffusing the uh, larger metal and when we see the what happened to the majority spins they can very easily diffuse into the heavy metal the band velocity or group velocity of this up spin or majority spins are higher and as a result of this the spins diffuse into the heavy metal and you can see there's quenching of the ferromagnets and there is a proximity induced magnetization in the heavy metal so this effect is well explained in this prl paper and then we use this effect this effect was used by the portobias comfort whether in the nature nanotechnology paper he showed that experimentally iron when the iron films are being excited using the femtosecond lasers and the interface with the ruthenium or gold layer and what they observe the emission of terahertz radiation and this terahertz radiations in the 16 the same group has shown that in the in the iron cobalt boron platinum iron cobalt boron tantalum thin films that the especially in the platinum there is a 30 terabit terahertz bandwidth can be observed this is a huge like all the photonic and spin tonics community comes into uh, comes in, comes together and try to attack the attack this particular interest of the uh, terahertz spin tonics uh, platform so they try to understand what could be the uh, mechanism and how this spin hall effect is dominating so they they propose that the charge current the tangent charge current is 
is proportional to the spin hall angle and then spin current js and then direction of magnetization of the ferromagnetic material and to understand this effect we also thought and we just made the samples in the same direction so what we did we made the new samples where the we use the plat platinum the platinum as a heavy metal and then permalloy fe and i as a ferromagnetic material and with the negative spin hall angle and the positive spin hall angle because for the negative spin hall angle we use a tungsten as a heavy metal and for the positive spin hall angle we use a platinum as a heavy metal so we use this two material and to show that there is the effect of the spin hall angle and we combine them to show the additive effect of the spin hall effect on the system and what we interestingly observe you can see here clearly in the let me take the uh, marker uh, this so you can see clearly here this is the this is the peak for the uh, tungsten where you, and we have reversed it you can see the negative sign because we have reversed to show that the additive effect and this is the terahertz emission from the tungsten and this is the blue is the terahertz emission from the platinum so if you add this to this two peaks the amplitude you can see that the black black peak which is a combination of the tungsten plus platinum and if you observe the terahertz emission from this tungsten permalloy platinum and we exactly match this so we can clearly say that the combined effect of this terahertz uh, uh, terahertz emission combined effect of this negative and spin hall effect and positive spin hall effect can be seen in the wireless system and that is and the simple the reason is very simple because when you shine a light on the ferromagnetic material the spin start diffusing in both direction the platinum direction towards the platinum and direction towards the tungsten and the direction of spin current is different both are opposite and we, utilizing the negative spin hall effect of the platinum or uh, uh, tungsten and the positive spin hall effect of the platinum we can add this to amplitude to the terahertz radiation and can give rise to a positive the enhanced terahertz positively enhanced terahertz radiation from the trilayer system to mimic to understand this further on the effect of the m magnetization directions so what we did we designed an experiment where what we can do we can trace a trace a peak of the terahertz amplitude as a function of the magnetic field and you can see this is the top layer shows the terahertz this is the top layer shows the magnetization versus the magnetic field recorded from the vsm and then bottom layer shows the terahertz amplitude recording from our this terahertz amplitude uh, terahertz pulse which has been generated by the shining the front to second layer so exactly both are matching to each other exactly we observe close quite close matching between that vsm measurement magnetic moment measurement and the terahertz amplitude interestingly what we observe clearly here you can see that in the tungsten there is a in the magnetic measurement vsm you can see the hysteresis curve is following the same what we have observed for the platinum and a the platinum tungsten trilayer system how are in the tungsten we can see the phase of the phase of the terahertz versus h hysteresis flip so it shows that the dominant mechanism for the terahertz emission is from the heavy metal which is a inverse spin hall effect so the super diffusive current which has been pumped from the ferromagnet to a heavy metal giving rise to a transient charge current is dominant mechanism for the spin electronics emitters to emit the terahertz radiation so the understanding of this spin hall effect is very very important for the systems so to understand this is one of hall effect we have to go for the analog techniques and what people are trying to do the they have uh, they have the spin to charge conversion and the spin to charge conversion understanding understanding this spin to charge conversion in the heavy metal there are different schemes in the electronic regimes and then people try to understand using that and as professor vidanta is also working in that directions i can see that uh, and so the what we have to shift the our focus to the electronic approach where we can see that how the spin hall effect is can be measured and can be used for the further designing the new set of experiment so we go to the electronic approach where we use the quantification of different quantification techniques to enhance the spin hall effect method uh, to measure the enhanced spin hall effect in the designed materials so these three techniques are the spin pumping inverse spin hall effect measurement where <clears throat> so spin current in being pumped into the heavy metal and be detected using the lock in techniques modulation techniques or uh, normal nano volt meters and non local in spin injection which is also a combination we can use this technique non local local spin injections for the both possible spin hall effect and inverse spin hall effect measurement and spin top ferromagnetic resonance so i will explain this one by one uh, because uh, 
So what happened in the, let's go to the spin pumping first. The spin pumping, what happened? If you apply, uh, if you have a ferromagnetic material and when you apply a magnetization, a magnetic uh, field to a magnetization of a ferromagnetic material, what happens? Because of the external magnetic field, magnetization tries to precess and try to align to the direction of the applied magnetic field. What happened? Because to pump this spins to uh, adjacent heavy metals, you have to have the precision ferromagnet. So we apply our external HRF field and allow the magnetizations to precess or con continuously or coherently so that we can pump that angular momentum to the adjacent heavy metal. So this is the basic principle of the ferromagnetic resonance and this is called the force oscillations. We have used the HRF to force the magnetizations to precess along the direction of the applied magnetic field. So once we have a precision ferromagnet, so this precision ferromagnet can be can be understand understand using the LLG equations where we have the spin current, we have the damping factor, and we have the backflow of the spin current from the uh, inverse spin hole effect, and all the terms are uh, highlighted in the LLG equations. So this pump, the this precision ferromagnet start pumping the spins into the heavy metal, and which you can see that example the 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 completely analogy to the system, to the energy harvesting is you can see the windmill. So you have a windmill, so the blades are moving and these blade, blades are, the moving blades can be used to harvest the, electricity, harvest the wind energy to our electric energy. And analogous to this, we have a magnetization precision, which is the precision magnetization can be used to, uh, to convert the, the precision magnetization to a electrical current. So the, this pump, spins are pumped, the, the, this precision spins are pumped into the heavy metal. And because of the inverse spin hall effect, we can detect this spin, uh, spin and spin voltage. The second is non-localized spin injections, where what we do, we apply the current here. And in the current, because of spin filtering effect, you can see that because this is the ground, ground, ground signal is here, what happened, the spin current, uh, the charge current goes this way, only the pure spin current will start to diffuse in this direction. And when this pure spin current will start diffusing in this direction, and this spin current will can exert, can, uh, can again pump back to the ferromagnet and can exert and torque on the ferromagnetic materials and can try to switch the direction of the magnetization, as you can see here. And we can detect the voltage based on the direction of the magnetization of the, of the material with respect to the initial, we can see that there is an increase and decrease in the voltage and we can store the two information up and down based on the magnetic resistance of the devices. So third is the spin torque ferromagnetic resonance, where what we do, we, we, we apply the charge current into the platinum or platinum, uh, platinum and or the heavy metal spin hole materials. And this charge current is when pumped into the heavy metals because of the spin hole effect, this charge current can exert, converted to the spin current and exert a torque on the adjacent ferromagnetic materials and give rise to a torque on the ferromagnetic material. So, and this, this, the analogy to this system is can be given very simply like the spin transfer torque mechanism, where what we can have, we have the ferromagnetic material, we have uh, this the heavy metal where we pump the charge current and the charge current is being uh, generated the spin current because of the spin hole effect. And this spin current will exert a torque on the heavy metal and can exert, uh, then can, uh, or even if the torque is enough, they can start the precision in the ferromagnetic material. And exactly like you, you, you connect the your fan to the electricity, the electricity is allowed to switch the, the fan and then the fan start rotating, exactly analogous to this. So these are the three different schemes. So keeping this scheme, so what we thought, okay, let's design the material. So for that, we can see the enhanced terahertz, enhanced terahertz as well as enhanced spin conductivity. So we thought of designing a new material where we chose the design of the platinum sulfide. Actually, we chose these four, oxygen, fluorine, sulfur, and chlorine. And we use the implantation technique to design these new materials. So what happened in the fluorine, we didn't get good result because this was very corrosive. And it, we have good result with the sulfur and then oxygen. Chlorine, we are still trying hard to get the result because, because of the reactive nature of the chlorine is still is very difficult. So, but we all this, because of the electronegativity of this four, four, four element, we choose this to enhance the potential gradient, to increase the spin orbit coupling of the heavy metal, and we choose this for implantation. So we have the results for oxygen and sulfur, and here I'm gonna present only on the sulfur. So we design this material, we use a platinum, we implant the sulfur, and we implant the sulfur on the fire, this, uh, uh, this uh, fluence of the fire into the power six, and eight keV to 12 keV uh, ions, 
and after implantations the device was fabricated and we do fabricate the device and what we observed after the implantation first thing was clearly want to see that how the implantation is affecting on the heavy metal so you can see that we did the we were the, everything all the steps was recorded and also observed the tm uh, during the implantation and you can see that the in the platinum after the implantation there is a there is a, a small distortion not much but the the roughness the interface or even the thickness of the platinum is not disturbed you can see this there is a scattering effect the struggling effect because you can see that there is a small amount to the platinum is struggle to the silicon which didn't the silicon dioxide and how are the the interface plus material is intact even after the deposition after the implantation of the silver we did the hrtm and we see the lattice is not disturbed much of the platinum and we do the els measurement and in els measurement we can clearly see that the 10% sulfur has been implanted in the platinum you can this is the sulfur map in map in the pts and most of the sulfurs is being stopped at the mgu and alo interface which was used as a protective interface to stop maximum sulfur and then uniform distribution of the sulfur in the pt so this was the this was the this was the prime aim of the deposition of the mgu and alo and after that we removed the mgu and alo using iron milling and then that was iron milling was also controlled by the end point detection detections very clean interface and was after that scm and afm was done to maintain the interface smoothness to check whether the uh, interface roughness and smoothness and the ferromagnetic deposition was done on the top of the pts implanted platinum after the implantation and making the device what we observe we we took the spin torque ferromagnetic resonance spectra and what we observe clearly there is a significant enhancement in the symmetric part of the fmr spectra so i will discuss this in a later part first i will say that the, because the first test to test whether there is a first uh, point to test is whether there is a damping like torque is this change in the line width so we clearly see that the, there is a changing line width of the pts interfacing the pamoloy or the, the the line width of the pamoloy interfacing with the pts as compared to the pamoloy interfacing with the platinum on the top i will, would like to mention here the inhomogeneous line width is almost same so it means that the quality of the pamoloy is almost same on the pt and pts and at the at the same point I, we also see that the effective magnetization of the sample which is interface pamoloy which is interfacing with the platinum sulfide is decrease a bit and that could be the because of the interface robert effect generally it gives rise to this this decrease in the effective magnetization of a system so we do we took the stfmr spectra we deconvolute this spectra and we just uh, try to see the symmetric and asymmetric component of the platinum and platinum sulfide what we observe here the symmetric component in the platinum as compared to this platinum sulfide is much lesser and we see the symmetry we do the anglo dependent phi scan in plane anglo dependent to see the symmetry of the torque and we see that the symmetry of the torque of this pt and pts is not broken it's almost same so this shows that we can use the line shape analysis first of all second we can use this method to estimate the spin to charge conversion sorry charge to spin conversion and we do that we just estimate the charge to spin conversion and we found that this is the 30% enhancement from the 10 to 30% enhancement of the spin to charge charge to spin conversion is being observed in the sulfur implanted platinum to further verify because there is there can be artifact when we do the spin transport measurement and spin effects because of the is high resistance because of interface there are, there could be many other effects which can dominate over the uh, voltage which we are det detecting so we go for the another method which is the modulation of damping so from the modulation damping you can see that what we do we apply the current into the platinum layer and we exert an additional torque because of the spin hole effect when we are measuring the spin torque ferromagnetic resonance and we see we record the line width versus the applied dc current and what we observe here from the modulation of damping we clearly observe, observe almost the same amount of the spin hole effect it was bit lesser it initially my spin hole effect it's 31 and in the modulation damping is was 29 but we averaged out 30 because in the spin pumping in the line shape analysis there is a contribution of inverse spin hole effect also there while in the modulation damping that effect is not there so but if it is more or less close to each other it says that we are in the we are perfectly in the same regime like uh, in the safe and we are we, our value is quite reliable so to understand this we have a charge to spin curve because the interface quality is not which we can decide from these two measurements 
we have to have the spin to charge and charge to spin conversion. If you really want to use the material for the, especially for any application, we have both the system because this is the reciprocal effect is also true. So we must have the charge to spin current and spin to charge current. These two effects should be combined together. To understand this, what we did, we designed the device for the inverse spin hall effect measurement also. And for that, we can see that we made the device in the coplanar, uh, co we designed the coplanar waveguide and we have a Pamoloi on the PPS and uh, the auto plane excitation regime uh, uh, geometry was used. And you can see the spin hall, uh, inverse spin hall effect voltage in the pure platinum, uh, the same amplitude as compared to the PPS. There's a, there is a clear change in the amplitude of the spin hall effect voltage is being observed and that to exactly the three times. So we clearly confirmed that there is a 30% enhancement of the platinum sulfide spin hall angle. That too with a very clean tra interface transparency from charge to spin and spin to charge. So the spin for interface transparency as well as the spin hall angle, both are improved. So that is that is very, very good. So this is this two point we try to, uh, and then we just wrote the manuscript and we try to sell these two points to the interface transparency. And then this is the both the spin to charge and charge to spin conversion both can happen at the same scale. So, and we try to find the dominating mechanism and it is not the scattering mechanism which was dominating. We realized this is the dirty metal resin where the sulfur implant was making the metallic character to the dirty metal resin. And we were able to see the mechanism was intrinsic mechanism for the spin to charge and charge to spin conversion in the platinum sulfide. And this was done using temperature dependent measurement studies and then spin hall conductivity with normal conductivity of the material. So after this, we um, this, this article was published in the advanced quantum technology recently, uh, last December. And as we, in the January, this, uh, this, this has been highlighted as a feature article where we have we, we were able to place the platinum and platinum platinum sulfide as the one of the one of the top candidate among all the PT derivative elements where the spin hall conductivity and the spin hall angle can be achieved very high. So this was this was article as the feature article, and we want to use this platinum and the platinum sulfides for the terahertz mission. So we understand this, and then we try to go back to the terahertz mission. So and then we see that we will use this both, but platinum sulfide work we are still in the continuation. We are working, and the, uh, today I'm going to discuss about the pure platinum work, how we use the platinum to generate the terahertz and to manipulate and to control the terahertz spin current and terahertz amplitude and phase of the light. So keeping in that mind. I went back to the photonic approach where we just use the platinum and, and the tungsten platinum to generate the terahertz emissions. And we use the make the device with the platinum tungsten, different platinum layer, different thickness of the platinum layer. Many different device was designed and the terahertz amplitude was recorded. And after the recording this terahertz amplitude, what we observe clearly, <coughs> there's a, we clearly observe the terahertz amplitude, we observe and we record the terahertz stresses. In the terahertz services, you can see that clearly when we increase the fluence of the terahertz, the influence of the laser excitation power, what are, and uh, what you can see that clearly there is a quenching of the terahertz stresses from this blue higher the cohesive field to a lower cohesive field. That was an interesting observation. First observation we observed. This is this this is interesting. So with the fluence of the laser. What is happening? There is a quenching in the hysteresis behavior of the ferromagnetic material, and you can see that with a different uh, different uh, laser flares, the coercivity decreases, and as well as the amplitude of the tera, the amplitude of the terahertz uh, pulse is increasing because with the higher higher fluence, what happens when you shine a laser on the ferromagnetic material with the higher fluence, the more spins can be excited, and then they can pump into the heavy metal. As a result of this, there is an enhancement of the terahertz pulse amplitude. So keeping that in mind, so we try to see the photothermal, we said see, oh, there is a, some, for, the thermal effect may be happening. So we try to understand the, what could be happen. So this, just to illustrate this, what is the photothermal effect? What happened when you shine a light on the material? And if it is the light is below the threshold value where the, there is no heating effect being observed, you will see the same hysteresis behavior what we will observe in the VSM. However, if this light can induce a photothermal effect the thermal energy can be brought using this light. What you will observe, you'll observe the quenching of this hysteresis because of thermal energy, like the people are using in the heated resistive microwave recording media recently. What they are doing, they are in the hammer devices, hammer heat assisted recording media, they are using the light 
light, the localized light, laser light, laser field, intense laser field to decrease the anisotropy of the ferromagnetic material, which is the iron platinum in the current situation. So, and you can have the positive terahertz amplitude here, and we have the this negative terahertz amplitude, and you can switch this after the photosomal effect to a positive terahertz amplitude. So we use this scheme to design the system and uh, to show that, that there is a switching of the terahertz and switching of the terahertz current is also possible. Terahertz phase and then switching of the terahertz current is also possible using the photothermal effect. So we we use this is scheme, same scheme, and we increase the fluence, and you can see that from the top, the, the, if the terahertz switch, terahertz emission is in positive, and if we keep increasing the photo, uh, this the pump fluence at a constant magnetic field, you can see there's a decrease, and then the phase of the terahertz radiation as well as the direction of the magnetization changes. So it's, it clearly shows that the photothermal effect can be used to switch the 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 phase of the terahertz radiation as well as the the accompanied by the the switching of the terahertz spin current in the system. To confirm this photothermal effect, we went back. We were thinking that oh, this is when we were uh, trying to write manuscript, we were trying to understand what could be the possible confirmations to show that photothermal effect. And we designed an experiment with a reflectivity measurement. And you can see that if the energy, the, if the sample temperature is raised, the reflectivity of the light for the sample is decreased or increased based on the temperature. So we, we designed the setup, the transient reflectivity measurement setup, and where we use, <coughs> we try to investigate, we are try to estimate the temperature of the sample using the true temperature model. And we found that the background temperature of the sample is being increased when we have pump the laser, pump the sample with a different fluence of the laser. And you can see from here and then said, this is the background sample which was decided by the preceding, preceding laser pulse and which is increasing the temperature of the sample. So this photothermal effect <coughs> is, uh, we can clearly see there's an increase in temperature in the system, system, but the question arises after this, oh, we can see the photothermal effect. There is a portion of energy with that uh, laser fluence. At the same time, this laser fluence is affecting on the anisotropy of the system. But laser, we have 100K, 100 kilohertz uh, laser. And whether this is a single, single pulse effect or is a multiple, multiple pulse effect or say accumulation effect. To understand this, this was a very interesting question in our mind. To answer this question, what was a, this is single pulse or multiple pulse effect of the laser? So we designed an experiment where we made two Two pulse measure uh, experiment, two, per, two terahertz pulse experiment, and the both the terahertz pulse was separated by 1.3 nanosecond, which was limited by our experimental table, uh, exper the optical experimental table. So, and then 1.3 nanosecond, uh, the gap was given, and what what, what we did, we did basically the, we record the crystallisis when the uh, laser we shine the uh, the ferromagnetic material with a small energy. And you can see that the coercivity of the hysteresis is almost same, the two, two ester. And however, when we change the energy, the fluence of this laser to a higher laser fluence above the threshold frequency, where the quenching of the terahertz coercive field, or uh, quenching of the coercive field in the terahertz hysteresis is being observed. You can see that the, because of this high energy, there is a quenching and then there is a decrease in the uh, coercive field. To understand this is a single effect, what we did, we designed the two, uh, this, uh, we combined these two lasers and then both were the, separated by 1.3 uh, uh, nanosecond gap. And then what we did, we recorded our hysteresis on the small and uh, so the low energy laser. And we quench and we also give the high energy laser, which was just preceding for, uh, just preceding for the recorded, preceding for the recorded laser. Uh, Recorded laser. So what we observe clearly, you can see here, there's a quenching of the coercive, coercive field in the terrorist which clearly says that this effect is a single pulse dominating effect because the preceding laser pulse, which is the preceding laser, the previous laser pulse, which is uh, which, which is basically already hit and then uh, pass through the sample has already heated the sample. And when we have the another laser pulse, the small, which will not give the hitting effect because this is just far below the threshold field of the thermal energy and give rise to the same effect. So we, we, all, we, we confirm and validate that this is a photothermal effect and that too with a single pulse dominated photothermal effect. And this, uh, this paper is published in recently in January, Advanced Function Material, and then we were able to uh, the, get the very good comments as well as the paper as accepted as a VIP paper from the, all the reviewers. 
So after this, uh, the photothermal effect, we tried to thought, oh, this especially, this effect can be also seen from the magnetoelectric effect and we cannot, we do not, cannot only use the photothermal energy, even we can use electric field to control this hysteresis. That is well-known effect. Like you can use the magnetoelectric effect to control this hysteresis and this hysteresis can modulate and that can this, if we can modulate this hysteresis, we can modulate the parahertz hysteresis. So keeping that in mind, we designed a new set of the sample where what we did, we had a PMNPT as a ferroelectric materials and we on the top, we deposit platinum and then ferromagnet and we shine a light on them. And, and at the same time, we are also applying the electric field. And with the electric field, exactly the same effect can be seen because we are modulating the terahertz hysteresis when we are applying the electric field and we are keeping the laser energy below the threshold frequency, uh, threshold field where the photothermal effect is not being observed. So that we can separate this to our contribution very clearly. So this is effect. And interestingly, what we observe, we clearly observe because the strain and unstrained position, there is a shift in the terahertz hysteresis and which was confirmed at the same maximum strain. You can see that we did the XRD of the, the PMPT crystals, the same strain, minimum and maximum strain. And there is a shift in the XRD peak of the strain. There is a uh, shift in the XRD peak position of the ferroelectric crystal PMPT. And when we record the terahertz amplitude on the same maximum and minimum strain positions, and there is a change in the terahertz amplitude of the uh, emitted terahertz radiation. To see that, what we did, we record this peak amplitude and try to mimic, try to try to record the temperature terahertz amplitude as a function of the electric field. And what we observe, there is a completely butterfly-like behavior of the terahertz pulse, terahertz amplitude as a function of electric field. So to and which is like a strain-like behavior. To further confirm this, we did the XRD as a function of voltage, and we can see this position of these two, two peaks was recorded as a function of voltage. And the hysteresis, this is the butterfly behavior, can also observe. The similar butterfly observe, uh, the behavior is also observed in the XRD measurements. So this clearly confirmed that we can have the completely field control configurable terahertz emissions and field control emission can be uh, further, this work is uh, further can be used for the terahertz switching and then field control uh, devices. So this work is under preparation and we are currently working on the uh, further directions to uh, complete this. So keeping that in mind, so we, what we are doing, we are trying to merge these two fields, the gigahertz and terahertz, and try to use these effects to make the read and write for the systems. And these are the psychic process. We have already observed in the terahertz hysteresis pair, we have used electric field and we can use actually, we can just uh, write, write the informations for the many cycles, almost 10 to the power three cycles, we have able to write the informations using the, uh, the electric field electric field tunable of the terahertz hysteresis. And this is the perspective people are trying to generate the gen, generate the devices or you're trying to make a devices where the speed of the devices is very high and they can use the terahertz ultra fast time scale phenomenas to further enhance the speed and the gigahertz phenomenas to further increase the aerial density and packaging of the systems. So keeping that in mind, we would also would like to contribute to the digital world where we will try to achieve the ultra, ultra dense and ultra fast memories and logic operations where we can try to minimize the, uh, this lot of effort or minimize the lot of this uh, basically effect which is all the industry and companies are going towards the uh, packaging of the uh, media. Thank you very much. And this is my research directions. Currently we are working on all this three, uh, three basically major major fields, then where it is in spin transport technology and spin photonics. And current focus are terahertz spintronics and spin hall effect measurements and magnonics. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, you're welcome. Hi, uh, hi Rohit, it's an excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, well, I missed the last few, uh, maybe last five minutes. Uh, I have to go for. Well, I ask a question. This is one is that, um, well, you you implant sulfur to increase the spin orbit coupling, is it? Yes, yes. So how does it vary as a function of the the uh, concentration of the the sulfur implantation? 
the yeah, spin yeah. charge efficiency yeah okay uh, so we 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 are actually we tried that we try we tried that with a different con con concentration of efficiency and we observed that the lower concentration the efficiency was 15% and for the higher concentration it was increasing 30% however for the lower concentration our device to device variation was there maybe some problem with it during the implantation so we didn't publish that data but there is with the increasing concentration up to the up to 10% we see the increase linear increase Mm, so after okay. this, after this, I can't comment because after this we didn't deposit, we didn't implant the above the ten percent. Uh, but you also try to implant as other uh, elements, oxygen, right? Oxygen, so, oxygen, With oxygen. We have seen, yeah. With oxygen, we have seen. Mm. We have seen the increase in the spin hall effect of yeah, with the oxygen. But with the chlorine. No, but what, why, why with oxygen and the chlorine? Because they are are they really participating in any spin orbit interaction? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me go to the here because you can see. Uh, okay. Uh, you can see here the spin orbit Hamiltonian basically is composed of this uh, p cross del b. This is the potential gradient. So what happened if we have the oxygen electronegative ions? There is a we can just generally create a metal oxide or metal sulfide metal interfaces where there is a higher potential gradient. So which can uh, result in the broken symmetry and can enhance the spin hole effect in the interface. Uh, spin orbit coupling in the material. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, I liked your talk. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rohit, for this excellent talk. And uh, thanks, Mohendra, for already kickstarting the discussion. So, uh, actually, I have one question on the same, uh, same topic. Sure. So, uh, how um, uh, you kind of plan um, for this kind of implantation? And by the way, uh, how did this implantation happen with this ion implantation or during spotting you just spoke? No, no, this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the control ion implantation. Okay, uh, this is done in IUC, first of all, in India. So uh, basically you prepare the thin film of platinum, then you deposit yeah. uh, okay. yeah. the ion implantation. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. we deposit that. What we did, we have, a, okay, this, this work, uh, truly speaking, this work, we almost took three years three years to compile because first year we were struggling to just for the implantation, only for the implantation. So what we did initially, oh, can I, uh, okay, uh, just, uh, if you allow me, I can draw. No, 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 I, when you say an implantation, I, I got it. So I will no, no, I, maybe, uh, maybe because I, I can draw because that, that will, okay. So basically in the first, first scenario, uh, let me go to the pen. Okay, so in the first, okay, you can see in the first scenario, what we did, we deposit the permaloid and the copper 10 nanometer and we deposit the platinum. So what happened when we implant in the, and on the top, we just covered, cap it with the MGO and ALO. So what happened we, when we implanted the platinum, what happened? This, this, because, because of this scattering, there's implantation in the platinum at this interface also. So that time in the first case, we had our permaloid property was not good. So we neglect, we already, uh, uh, this experimental results, we did not, did not able to publish and just we uh, discard these results. In the second case, what we did, we just took the, we removed the permaloid and we just took the platinum and we took copper and we also took the uh, MGO LO interface. But we were confused that this interface is playing role and this interface is playing role because we want to stop this one. We say that the copper has negligible efficiency of spin to charge conversion. So this result also we discard. Then finally, what we did, we just took the 10 nanometer platinum. On the top, we took the MGO, then ALO, and then after that, we just implant. So when we, and, and we control, and this is the low energy implantation so that we can stop most of the implantation at this MGO interface. And the, only the few sulfur items can go into the platinum. So this was a third trial and we, we were able to successful because and everything was measured in the cross-sectional TM and then ELS measurements that time during the implantation. After implantation, we cut the sample in FIB and we take the measurement of the ELS and we see up to what level that the implantation is going and we control the energy, we control the fluence. This was doing almost one year we were doing this. And finally, we were able to see that we can optimally control the implantation so that we can change the property of the platinum. Okay. And you, yeah, you can ask me one more question because why MGO? Because people are always asking me this, ALO and MGO is same oxide. Why you put the ALO and MGO? Because initially we were not putting MGO. So 
but when we are putting ALA only, it's difficult to see from the endpoint detection in the EDX that where to stop. So we have put the thin layer of MGO to get the better signal of the EDX at the endpoint detection to stop exactly the interface. Um, so actually, Mohindra asked already, but uh, somehow I didn't. Uh, I'm not very clear. Um, so now you say that the sulfur is basically getting accumulated at the uh, top inter uh, top surface of platinum. Yes. It's yes. not a real alloy of platinum sulfur. No, no, no. Uh, okay. It it is. No, no, no. Please go back to that slide, Ruth. I have yeah. some questions there. Sure, sure, sure. So then, uh, how this uh, sulfur accumulation is changing the uh, spin orbit interaction? This I can, could not understand. Okay, because. Okay, you can you can see that the, this is if the, we have a pure platinum and we have a platinum and platinum sulfide bond because of this there is a potential gradient interface delta v can increase right. So if this delta v is increased, the spin orbit Hamiltonian will directly give the enhanced spin orbit coupling of the system. That means uh, instead of sulfur, if I take any element, it, it will always give a delta v. Exactly, exa exactly, exactly. That's why people are that's, that's why there are there were a lot of report. Of the electronegative elements, PTO, PT copper, GDO, tantalum, and they were trying to increase the spin to charge conversion using this technique only. Okay, so all these examples on the right side, so yeah. they have mostly done similar yeah. ion plantation of oxygen. Okay, correct, absolutely. And, uh, uh, and this paper is this paper is uh, the co sputtering with the oxygen. They, this is the SS Perkin paper where he has just introduced oxygen in between when he is depositing tantalum. So that he can induce some amount of oxygen in defects at the same time. Okay, so it's all uh, basically some implantation, but they are mostly at the surface. So it uh, creates a gradient of uh, potential. Yeah, at the at the surface. But in our case, we have a surface plus interface both. Because you can see you can see that in our case, you can the ELS measurement at the surface is, is is almost a little bit high, but with throughout the film, throughout the platinum film, throughout the platinum film, this film, the our sulfur concentration is almost fit, constant, 10%. See the from the color map. Okay. Okay, so this is the sulfur accumulation. Uh, yeah, Puspendra has a question and he, he just sitting next to me. Puspendra can ask. Sure, me. sure, he can directly ask me. Yeah. Directly ask me. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hmm. So, sir, in slide number 28, you yeah, have okay. shown that. Uh, uh, Sorry, your echo is very high. Maybe uh, because of this. Two questions. You can switch over there. Now just speak there. It's okay. You can speak there. Yeah. This is slide number twenty-eight. Oh, where is my slide number twenty-eight? Which one? Are you telling? Yes, this one, sir. Twenty-nine, right? Okay. This one. Uh, yes, sir. This one. This one. Okay. So in this slide, sir, you have shown that with respect to uh, frequency, amplitude is getting changed. Yes. So, sir, uh, why this change is happening? The uh, uh, in normally FMR, we have observed that when we increase the frequency, that time amplitude continuously decreases. But in your case, it is increasing, then for then further decreasing. So why this uh, why this is happening? Is there any reason behind this? Yes, there is a reason behind this. So if you allow me to change my uh, slides, yes. then I can I can explain you very well that this part. Yes, no Okay, can I change my slides? Yes, sir. I'm just uh, opening my one slide, which is which has this answer, and it will just help you to understand. This one.
Okay. You can see my slide, right? Yes, sir. So, uh, let me go to this one, then slide show from front side. Okay. So, the answer behind this, uh, okay, you can see two screen, right? Not one. Yeah, yeah, we see two screen. Now it's okay? Yeah. So, answer behind this is the concept of the spin pumping and uh, concept of spin pumping as well as the precision coal angle. So how to justify your question? Because what happened when you when you excite this ferromagnet, this ferromagnet in the inverse spin Hall effect measurement. So your strip is here, and when you excite, generally we excite in outer plane excitation mode. So in outer outer plane excitation mode, when you measure the ISHE voltage, ISHE signal, so you always get when you see from low to high, you always get initially the spin current amplitude increases, then decreases. This is not because of the enhancement of the spin hall effect. The, the amplitude is because of this, but this the trend of the increasing and decreasing because the spin hall effect is a frequency invariant. It should be constant for all the frequencies. So what happened? At this 4 to 14 gigahertz, there is a change in the spin hall. Uh, there is a change in the precision cone angle. So for that, we also have the one APL paper uh, in the in the this. Uh, APL paper and we have clearly shows that this precision cone angle, so to, uh, to precision cone angle, the important role of this precision cone angle and which decide this, especially uh, this, this profile of the, this going up and then coming down. And you can see that what happened, we estimate the charge uh, spin current. And from the AMR, you can see this AMR, this is anisotropic metal resistance measurement. And in the AMR measurement, we did the AMR measurement, we tried to Calculate the from the MR measurement. We calculate the metal resistance. We feed in the this uh, this this spin current density measurement, and we try to see that this the spin current density is increasing, then further decreasing because of the MR. And when you estimate considering this precision cone angle separately, estimation and what we observe, the spin hall angle of the platinum is almost constant, irrespective there is an increase in the uh, spin hall voltage and decrease with the frequency. And you can say that there's a convergence. This is the reason behind this. Clear reason behind this. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, this is uh, published as an APL, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is published as an APL, okay. yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, are there other questions uh, from any anybody else? Okay, looks like uh, everybody is happy. And uh, we got uh, a, an audience of more than 20 people, which is not bad. So uh, again, uh, I like to sincerely thank uh, my co-convener, Dr. Prasbhushan Singh, probably is not well. So yeah, so he's absent for some days. But anyway, so uh, from our team, uh, we sincerely thank Rohit uh, and we clap for you for your very excellent uh, lecture. And we are very happy to see that uh, you are, uh, you know, career is exponentially increasing and that's really good to see and I wish you all the best and uh, let's keep in touch and uh, let's see what we can do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you, thank with you, that note, uh, I, I wish uh, all of you a good health and uh, see you next week. Our speaker is uh, Professor Peter Fisher from uh, Lawrence Berkeley, Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, next week, is it at 11 a.m.? Okay. It's 11 a.m. Okay, so see you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye. See you, see you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.